sponsored by KiwiCo. Change the way your kids play with Kiwi. Visit kiwico.com slash astronomy and get your first grade free. That's kiwico.com. Hello and welcome to our live coverage of what we hope will be an exciting launch of an Electron 
rocket from New Zealand. My name is Dr. Pamela Gay and I am here to put science in your brains. We have no Annie Wilson today. She is off enjoying a family event, so you're stuck with me. And I hate to say it, but she knows a lot more about rockets than I do. So we're going to be learning all of this together. Now, those of you who turned tuned in for the pre-show, uh, I had a mic flail, so you got to hear me recording our advertisement for tomorrow's astronomy cast. Um, sorry, mistakes were made. Um, I am pleased to say I am up in the attic today. This may sound like an odd thing to be excited about, but this means it's spring, it means the temperatures are up, and it means I can work someplace where I can leave the green screen behind me up all the time. And this is super exciting. Um, and I'm being told the mic isn't good. That's sad. How, how bad is the mic? I'm in a super echoey room. I haven't figured out how to fix the echo yet. I'm hoping that that's the product problem that you're dealing with is the super echoiness of it. Um, if not, I will work on finding a different mic. It is the webcam mic, I will admit to that. Um, I was lazy in setting things up, but I will work on having a different mic for other days. The attic can be a jerk. Herleu has been up here on the days where we've had on three different space heaters and we were still shivering. Uh, yeah, so um, today's rocket launch is part of a series of launches that will be occurring roughly once per month that have all been commissioned by DARPA. Now, before we work on figuring them out together, I do need to uh, upload the ad for tomorrow's astronomy cast or Susie will reach through the internet and for good reason that I will completely deserve, she will kill me. Um, so we hate having to do ads, but this is how we pay our bills. So Susie is currently paid thanks to your generous contributions over on Astronomy Cast, as well as thanks to the revenue that comes in off of these ads. Um, this also covers servers, it covers software. This ad in particular is going to allow us to get her a license for Adobe Creative Suites, which means that her audio editing skills are about to get turned up to 11. So thank you for all we do, for all you let us do. I can speak English, I really can. Um, and there it goes, completely uploading. Now for today's launch, um, we are waiting to see when things go live. According to the rocket launch page, which I am about to share with all of you, um, they will be beginning their live coverage at about 21 past the hour. We did start early because, well, I figured why not give the spacecraft a little bit more of its due. Um, okay, so the Electron rockets are some of the smallest rockets that are out there. They are designed by a company down in New Zealand. They are launching from a remarkably far south location. If you've never looked on a map to go to see where New Zealand is, first of all, go look at a map. Um, New Zealand is down off the coast. It's off the eastern coast of the southern quartile of Australia, and it is a pair of islands, a North Island and a South Island, that are some of the most stunningly beautiful landscape in the world. Uh, they have these super rugged mountains, and the reason the mountains are so rugged is because the land is new and they haven't had time to get worn down and eroded. This is considered to be a new continent rising up out of the ocean geologically. Now, the Electron rockets uh, completed their flight qualifications back in 2016. So this is a fairly new technology. They've only been flying uh, since May of 2017. So we're not even two years in to them launching. Um, oh, what's going on? Oh. 
Oh man, I don't know what is up with Twitch deciding that really Carl Sagan is more important to watch. Um, I may need to unhost Cosmos so that that stops happening and that would make me sad. Okay, um, not quite sure what to see there to say there. So far, um, to go back to hello, Arnstro, good, you made it in. Um, so to go back to what I was talking about, um, these are tiny rockets. These are the kinds of rockets that you look at and you go, oh, that's cute. You think you're a rocket, don't you? And then it takes off into space and it's sort of like, huh, okay, those can be built tiny. These are only about 1.2 meters in diameter. Um, that means like the entire rocket, I could like reach halfway around. These are huggable rockets. I don't think you should go hug one now. Um, in general, don't touch spacecraft unless you're told to. Um, so they're, they're super tiny and they're designed to launch things that weigh um, only 330 to about 500 pounds. This is 150 to 225 kilograms. So this is the size of um, basically a very large human being to a very, very large human being. Uh, they're tiny. They're very tiny. Um, Yes, Picard touched the warp ship, but in general, you shouldn't touch your spacecraft. Don't touch spacecraft. Um, oh, I see people joining, and you're joining so fast, I'm not having a chance to say hello. Hello, Tellerin. Hello, Drop Bear. Hello, Kerbal. Hello, Jandraloon. Um, there's hello, Keeper of Maps. Hello, Paranor. Um, all sorts of stuff going on. Um, so they're, they're meant to launch little tiny things. They uh, are able to, to deliver things. Um, the, the <laughs> Thank you, Astro YYZ, for the subscription for six months. I have no dogs up here with me, or I would throw Cheerios at them. Thank you so much. Um, it's greatly appreciated. Um, yes, Arnstro. I was thinking more of the fragile, but you're right. You can get like freezer burn from a rocket if you touch it at the wrong time. Um, okay, to go back to what I was talking about, um, with the electrons, one of the things according to their Wikipedia page, and yes, I'm using their Wikipedia page as a source, um, the price for delivering 150 kilograms to a 500 kilometer sun synchronous orbit is about $6 million per launch. So these things are super cheap to launch. You can't build a multi-million, a multi-meter telescope for that little money. Um, so these are just cute little rockets. And they have an amazing oomph. Um, they're planning to launch the Moon Express lander for um, what used to be the Google Lunar X Prize. Uh, so yeah, they have lots of cool things they are planning to do. Hello, Super Cowboy 75. Um, so, so they're launching from the Mahaya Peninsula in New Zealand. And this particular location that they're um, launching from is really good for putting things in polar orbits. That's where they talk about solar sun synchronous orbits and their pricing. A sun synchronous orbit is an orbit that has you going around the Earth such that you always see shadows the same way beneath the spacecraft. Hello, Astro B London. Hello, Astro YYZ. Um, so sun synchronous orbits are good for a lot of different things. One of the best things for, to use them for is to look for changes on the planet. It's harder to notice what's different between two images when the shadows are the thing that is different everywhere you look. 
If you have two different images that have the sun angle the same, the shadows the same, it's really easy to tell that something moved, something's been added, something's different. So sun synchronous, sun synchronous satellites are used to keep track of how things change on our planet. These are Earth studying missions in a lot of different cases. Um, so our instructor points out sun synchronous equals polar orbit with just a touch of retrograde inclination which allows each path over the earth to experience the same sun angle every single pass. So that slight retrograde inclination is taking into consideration the fact that the earth is moving around the sun and if they didn't slowly change the orbit um, the earth would take that sun synchronization away from the spacecraft through its own passage around the solar system. So there's lots of different things to keep track of. Now, as I said, this is a DARPA mission that we're looking at for today. It is the DARPA R3-D2 mission. And um, the website still says, check back here for live coverage. Um, and it should start 15 minutes before liftoff. We still don't have the live coverage, but we still have about 10 minutes to go before it is supposed to start. Now, that long combination of words that I just used, or long combination of letters I used, um, to identify this spacecraft, what it boils down to is this is part of the DARPA prototype reflector array antenna. Um, according to the webpage from DARPA describing this mission, DARPA's Radio Frequency Risk Reduction Deployment Demonstration, R3-D2, is set for launch in late February, okay, so it became May, uh, became March, uh, to space qualify a new type of membrane reflect array antenna. The antenna made of a tissue-thin Kapton membrane brain, packs tightly for storage during launch and then will deploy to its full size of 2.25 meters in diameter once it reaches low Earth orbit. Uh, R3-D2 will monitor antenna deployment dynamics, survivability, and radio frequency characteristics of a membrane antenna in low Earth orbit. So let me give you a link to learn more. So basically we're looking at how these things are able to survive. This is a technology test and um, we probably won't get to know much about it because it's a DARPA mission, but that's okay. Um, yeah, R2-D2's relative. That's the exact same thing I thought when I saw you. PM me your nachos. That is a fabulous username. And now I want nachos. It never takes long for this particular channel, channel to distract itself into discussing food. Um, it's always about food. Um, okay. Checking up on the chat and seeing if there's anything to to, to talk about. Arnst is completely right that satellites like this are useful for scientifically observing how glaciers move, how ice sheets move. They're also used to look for erosion. And then there's some really fabulous uses, like currently there is a massive flower bloom taking place out in California because it's been so wet this year. These odd weather patterns um, where occasionally you get snow in the Saudi desert and occasionally you actually get massive fields of wildflowers in California. These spacecraft are capable of noticing all these different things. They're also fabulous for seeing the effects of landslides, seeing before and after with hurricanes, and for doing other kinds of just getting a firm understanding of how our planet is impacted by our constantly changing weather. Now, um, I will warn you, and I'm going to check on this right now, speaking of weather, we are slated to have 
terrible weather coming my direction. We have a th severe thunderstorm watch in place. Um, and I will share with you our weather in just a moment. So there is a chance that this will get interrupted um, by, by all the terrible things going on on the planet right now. And unfortunately, the website I used changed their interface just enough to make me slightly confused. Okay, so here we go. Let me pull this up. Okay, so I'm going to switch views so that you can see the same thing I am seeing. So this is Wonder Map by the Weather Underground, which is part of weather.com, or at least owned by the same parent company. Um, I am, let's see, come on, drag over a little bit. I am, usually it pops up and shows Edwardsville. There's Collinsville. Come on, show Edwardsville. There it is. So I am over here in Edwardsville and it looks like it's not as bad as predicted um, where I am, but further south there are some nasty thunderstorms. I'm kind of annoyed that this layers thing is right in the middle. I have no idea how to make it go away, so we're just going to deal with it. Um, so it looks like we should be mostly okay during this broadcast. Yeah, I do have tornado warnings um, not too far away. Let's turn on the severe weather warnings. Now, of course, you see the Mississippi nicely traced out with flood warnings. There are massive flood warnings this year for the river. This red, I believe, is tornado. Yep, the red is tornado. And um, come on, stop. And then yellow is the th severe thunderstorm. So we will be keeping an eye on this throughout this broadcast. I still see light coming in through our skylight up here in the attic. So um, yeah, these are the things that happen when you live in the Midwest. Uh, I really am not liking this new interface that they have provided us on Weather Underground. All right, so let's do this so that we can see what might be coming our way. That layers bar, I can't make it go away. I'm, I'm really annoyed. It does not need to be right here. I can't drag it. I can't make it go away. It is determined. Let's, aha, let's see what happens with settings. Okay, okay. I dislike this upgrade to this particular page. Um, grumble, grumble. All right, this is just what we're going to have to live with. Uh, so I can't move it. I, I can move the background. I can't move the layers bar. <laughs> so we're just kind of stuck. We're just kind of stuck. Yeah, it's full of hate. This is what I've decided. But anyways, so I'm right here. The Mississippi points at me and we shall keep an eye on what's coming this direction. Um, thunderstorm watch 32 in effect just south of me. So we shall watch, we shall watch. But the real reason we're here is in hopes that this page will update the message went away that was there a moment ago. There had been notice saying that live coverage would start 15 minutes before launch. That message went away. Okay. Let me see what I can find on Twitter. <sighs> Rockets, they're fickle mistresses. They do as they will, when they will, and yet we love them and do their bidding. 
Okay, let's see what this has to say. Electron. So one hour ago, uh, they were discussing um, that the um, liquid oxygen fuel fueling was underway. Two minutes ago, they tweeted, blue skies over launch complex one, weather is green for launch. The webcast for today's mission will be live in 60 minutes. Did I time zone wrong? Okay. UTC minus five is normally Boston, but okay, let's current time in Boston. Please give me a UTC comparison. Nope. Um, versus UTC. I hate daylight savings time. Um, oh man, we're an hour off. We are an hour off. Dang it. Dang it. All right. We are an hour off. I don't know what to do. We are early, it is true. Okay, so. <sighs> Story time. So, so the reason that, that <laughs> Rocket Sage is now hosting us, that's awesome. Um, let's talk about rockets. Um, hello, Rocket Sage. Hello, Noel. Um, yeah, so we're here very early today. So, um, yes, we shall keep going. I'm not quite sure what we will do, but we will keep going. Um, the, the reason that I paused is... Some of you know I'm recovering from a scratched cornea and my eyeball hurts from too much glare. Um, it's currently doing okay. I just know that my eyeball is currently a ticking time bomb toward pain. So at some point there's going to be a pardon me while I go fill more goop into my eye and my left eye is going to continue to look shiny and glossy and not entirely pretty and I will make it shinier and glossier at some point but we shall proceed um so what do you want to talk about good people yeah drop bear I totally so it was one of these things I, I feel like I'm a cautionary tale for something and I haven't figured out what yet um I woke up just with this horrible pain in my eye and I was like rub 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 before I was fully awake and in the period of time between starting to wake up and I didn't look at the pictures of your Sven Mill for good reason um, in the period of time between starting to wake up and being awake enough to know you're not supposed to rub your eye when something was in it I apparently did the damage um, I've been to a doctor multiple times. Um, normally these things heal in just a few days, but I, I have a thyroid problem. And it turns out that if you have low thyroid or high thyroid, both affect your eyeballs. So it's only if you have perfect thyroid that you have eyeballs that are happy. And so I suffer from dry eye and this connection didn't get fully made because doctors don't always talk to each other the way they should. And so the fact that I need to be like loading my eyeball with not just eye drops, but goop, um, just, it got missed. So, um, I now know I need to load my eyeballs with moisturizing goop on a regular basis. 
And yes, yes, we are not sharing eyeball photos. So Rocket Sage, it's, I just, there was something in it. There was something in it. Um, yes, I'm permanently behind the eyeball. It's true. It's true. But, um, yeah. And one of the super weird things, so I can, I can discuss optics right now. So here are fun tricks you can do with a telescope. If you have a telescope and you take it slightly out of focus and it's a telescope that has a secondary mirror at the top, what you'll see when you try to focus is when you take your telescope slightly out of focus, um, you'll actually see that secondary in your, in your bright thing that you're looking at. So uh, a good thing to do this with is like Venus or Jupiter, a nice big bright planet or star. Take it slightly out of focus and you'll end up with a bright donut with a circle in the center. Well, if you mask the front of your telescope with a smiley face and you take your telescope slightly out of focus, you see a smiley face and so on and so forth. So you can actually affect the shape of what you see when things are slightly out of focus by changing the the way that light gets into the mirror. Now I appear to have etched an almost perfect circle in my eyeball. I don't recommend doing this. I'm going to keep repeating do not try this at home. So the effect is um, I'm going to show you a picture, diamond ring effect, solar eclipse. So the way my eye currently looks when I look at all lights um, in a darkened environment is pretty much everything looks like this. Um, now it, it, it's not identical to this, so it's darker over here, it's brighter over here. So if this is a headlight, coming off the headlight is a bright arc of light and then a fainter arc of light. So then, imagine you try and drive, and this is how I realized I had done something truly bad to myself. Every headlight becomes a giant diamond ring effect. Every street light, every light out there becomes the diamond ring effect. This is extremely disturbing. And yeah, yeah. So don't scratch your eyeballs, people. Do not do it. Um, I, I'm not even a J.J. Abrams fan that much, Paranor. I mean, I, I like I like some of the stuff he does, but the lens flare, there's just a little bit too much of it. <sighs> Our instro, what on earth? Um, yeah, no, I think... It, the the Christmas it it basically looks like someone has just had way too much artistic insanity with my eyeballs. Yeah, Rocket Sage, eyeball problems totally freak me out too. <sighs> yeah. So now you know. Thank you for the lurk, Rocket Sage. Um well so, so here, here's the thing, Henny Zorver. I, I now have a job where I'm paid hourly and, and that's fine. I still have a job and a lot of people out there don't still have jobs. Um, and so I took off most of a week because my eyeball just hurt and working at a screen just hurt. And I haven't been hourly since I was an undergraduate and yeah, yeah, mistakes were made. It turns out you really should just work through it when you're sick sometimes. 
<sighs> Anyways, so, so, other things going on. Um, this is your chance to ask me anything. So, Noel, what I've learned is eye patches um, actually trap moisture and um, other stuff up against your eye. And there's a difference, apparently, between filling my eyeball with moist stuff that evaporates and filling my eye with moist stuff and then putting an eye patch on and trapping the moist stuff in there where the trapping the moist stuff in there, um, while it would feel good for a little while, might lead to a really bad infection. So I recognize many of you would love to see me with an eye patch. If it helped my eye not hurt more, I would do it in a heartbeat. I'm at that point. <sighs> But no, I want my eyeball. I want my eyeball and a really big hat. Our Instagram, I look terrible in hats. I look truly, truly terrible in hats. Some people shouldn't wear hats. I am one of those. Um, would you use an eye patch Mac? I don't know what that is. I need a parrot. I can get behind that. I can get behind the idea of a parrot. Parrots are actually kind of amazing because they're so darn smart. <sighs> That's all I've got though. Um, for the electron to be in, okay, so I'm being asked to actually discuss science. I can do that. Um, this is me actually making sure I don't screw up any of the details on this because it is a liquid oxygen fueled rocket, but it has a really funky design. Um, and as I said, Normally, you would have our fabulous uh, Annie Wilson, Binary Blaze, here hosting you for a rocket launch, but she does have a family engagement. Um, so this particular uh, rocket is two stages. Again, super tiny, 1.2 meters in diameter. You could hug it. Don't. Um, it's made of lightweight carbon composite material, and it has what's called a Rutherford rocket engine. This is an electric pump fed engine. And let me look up more on this. So it's it's manufactured in the United States. And as its propellants, um, sorry, it uses LOX and RP1 as its propellants. And it's the first flight ready engine to use the electric pump feed cycle. It is used on the company's own rocket, the Electron. Um, okay, but tell me how it works. <sighs> um, I did not know this. Ernest Rutherford is from New Zealand. I had no idea. I always assumed he was British. So it just keeps saying electric pump feed cycle. Let me click on more links to see if I can understand this. So an electric electric pump feed engine is a bi-propellant rocket engine. Most engines are bi-propellant. They have two substances, one that is the fuel and one that's the oxidizer. Um, with the fuel pumps are electrically powered and so all of the input propellant is directly burned in the main combustion chamber and none is diverted to drive the pumps. Okay, so that's that's what the electric pump part is, is, is they have a motor engine that drives the pumps and so it's not using the rockets to provide its own energy. It's taking its energy with it. Um, that's cool. <laughs> I 
love how everyone's like, I don't want to grow up. You don't have to grow up. We can all be Peter Pans together. Um, thank you, Rocket Sage, for gifting Kerbal a sub. That's awesome. Um, that's an excellently timed Doctor Who quote. So yes, let's light up the chat for that sub. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, okay, so let's see what else we can learn about this. So each engine has two small motors that generate 50 horsepower. So this is a 100 horsepower rocket. It's spinning at 40,000 rotations per minute. The first stage battery can provide one megawatt of electric power. So these are simply nice, cute little engines that are battery powered. And um, yeah, this is cool. Now, I don't know if any of these are recoverable. That's what I'm trying to figure out now. They have a ton of planned launches. I believe these are almost straight to orbit. Hanny Zorvrup is so right. You don't have to be a grown up. Just get a job that allows, that pays for your childish moments. It's true. It's true. Um, so I'm Googling to see if these are at all re reusable. Um, they're so low, low cost, I'd understand if they pretty much throw them out. So it looks like from what I'm seeing, they're concentrating on getting to orbit. Um, and they've decided to not be reusable. They're so cheap that basically it's okay to throw them away. Did I say reguable? Uh, Reugable? Yeah, I might have said that. It's been a long day. Um, okay. So we're still 40 minutes away from launch, basically. What other questions do you guys have? Um, it has been a week for asteroids. Uh, to catch everyone up, thank you, Crispy Fried Man, for subscribing for four months in a row. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know if NASA's pretty much abandoned research into EM drives. This is one of those times that I think I need to clarify that NASA funds people to do research. It doesn't generally do research itself. There are exceptions. There are scientists at various NASA centers that do research. Um, so, uh, trying to catch up on chat. Um, so, when, when you read about NASA is doing EM drive research, what you're actually reading about is researchers funded by NASA, either at a university, a research center like I'm at, or at a NASA center, have been provided grant money that allows them to explore the feasibility of things like EM drives. Um, so different people can get research funds to do all sorts of different exploratory research to delve into what is possible at the cutting edge of technology. So uh, I, be careful how you phrase things. And I don't know, NASA funds a whole lot of different things. Um, and chat, oh, you're discussing asteroids, okay. Uh, Bennu and Ryugu are awesome rubble piles. So uh, currently there are spacecraft out orbiting two different asteroids, Ryugu and Bennu. 
uh, Hayabusa 2 is at Ryugu. This is a Japanese spacecraft with components from other nations around the world. And the asteroid is about 500 meters across, and it's primarily made of carbonaceous materials, and it's just covered in boulders and rocks and crumbly bits, which meant that when it got there last spring and when they finished mapping it and looked at it over the summer, they had this moment of holy expletive. There is nowhere entirely safe for us to go get a sample from our original mission plans, and so they had to redesign their mission in real time. And they did it. They have retrieved what should be their first of three samples. We are still waiting for information on when they're going to go and get their next sample. Uh, the OSIRIS-REx mission is currently orbiting Bennu. We got new images uh, last week, and oh dear god, Bennu is like I've seen gravel pits with fewer rocks than that asteroid. This is a slightly larger rock. It is 900 meters across. It has a bit higher of a metal content. Things like nickel have a higher um, abundance in the second asteroid. And now I'm waiting to hear how we're going to go down and grab rocks off of Bennu. Uh, so I saw that, that Noel asked, what is being launched today? So the Electron rocket that we're awaiting for the launch of uh, out of New Zealand is going to be launching a DARPA uh, antenna. This is largely a feasibility test where they are trying to figure out uh, does this new antenna that they've put together hold up to the rigors of space. So Kerbal is asking, can you really orbit an asteroid? I thought the gravity was too low. At least I assume that's what that combination of letters was meant to say. Uh, it's really hard. You basically put yourself into an orbit just beside the asteroid and then nudge yourself so that you're just barely missing it. And it's a delicate and complicated thing, but you can orbit it because there's not a lot else to be pulling on you. So it's hard. And the force of sunlight is something you actually have to take into account in calculating all the things when you figure these systems out. Um, so yeah, it's hard, but you can do it. Uh, Super Cowboy 75 says, are ion engines reliable enough yet to use in deep space exploration? Yes, ion engines are, as near as we can tell, totally reliable. The issue with ion drives is you go so slowly. We've used ion drives to do things like uh, use the Dawn mission to first go and look at the asteroid Vesta and then to travel out to the asteroid series. Here's where you have one asteroid that's wet and one that's dry. The inner part of the asteroid belt has been baked completely dry by our sun. The outer part of the asteroid belt, it was just far enough away to escape the uh, heat of the young sun, and those asteroids got to keep their early water. Now, Vesta um, was the one that was visited first, Ceres was visited second, and now um, Dawn has shut down and all the science is still being processed. <laughs> I like the joke in chat. Oh, what's this? Can I lick that? Yes, geologists have a tendency to lick rocks. Now, the rocks that are being retrieved by Hayabusa 2 are going to a facility in Japan that is perhaps one of the most complicated vacuum systems I've ever seen diagrammed out. Um, it's, there's no licking that's going to occur. This is a clean room with a vacuum sealed system that there's going to be no interchange of materials. Uh, largely because you don't want to contaminate the space rocks if you're trying to figure out what all the space rocks are made of. Uh, yeah. Um, 
So our instro is commenting, the orbit around Bennu is the smallest one any spacecraft has ever made. In this case, the gravity of Bennu is on par with the light pressure from the sun. Yes, that is entirely true. One of my favorite things about the science that we're doing at Bennu is this world, due to its unusual interactions with light, uh, suffers from a long known uh, issue called YORP. This is the asteroid's rotation is actually getting spun up by the force of photons hitting it and transferring their momentum. This means that sunlight is essentially spinning up just like you might spin up a merry-go-round at a park. This asteroid is getting spun up by sunlight. This is just cool. And another thing about it that we're still trying to understand is this is an active asteroid. This is an asteroid that is spraying debris into outer space. Uh, it's just weird. It's just weird. Um, <laughs> it's all right, Arnstro. Um, Arnstro is responsible um, for a fabulous, fabulous quote. Um, I'm going to see if I can find it quickly in my own Twitter feed. I don't know if I can. Um, let's try searching. So uh, from our instro, according to Walt Whitman, the quote reads, I sound my barbaric yap across the rooftops of the world. Bennu, on the other hand, would rather say, I sound my barbaric yorp across the rubble of my surface, um, which is quite fabulous. So going back to checking on the status uh, of, wow, Discord just exploded. It exploded with stuff and things. Um, so going back to looking to see what updates we may have on the Electron. Rocket Lab hasn't said anything new since the last um, since the last tweet. So let's see. I'm going to try and pull this up so that I can share the image they have with you. really wants me to log in and I really don't feel like it. Okay, here we go. So here we can see from 30 minutes ago, there is our little tiny rocket and they managed to image it so it looks so big. Again, this is only like three and a half feet wide or yeah, about three and a half feet wide. So it's tiny. Don't hug your rockets, people but it's so tempting to hug a rocket. Uh, here's another one. Let's see if I can embiggen that. So there's the locks filling underway. And, and they make an excellent point. So the white that you see right here on the image, the white that is appearing, that's actually frost from filling it with liquid oxygen. And the reason that we see the rocket changing color to now look like this is that white is coming from filling it up with the liquid oxygen. Um, so we essentially, instead of having a color changing glass, have a color changing rocket. Um, that's cool, crispy fried man. That's very cool. Do you have a, um, link you can share in? Yeah, Paranoria is thinking the exact same thing. So here's a past launch. 
um, expect gorgeous launch from the prettiest launch complex in the world. I will agree with that. Uh, New Zealand is truly stunningly beautiful. So here it is prior to any fueling going on. So you have solid black. Here you see the white starting to come in and here you see you can tell exactly where the liquid oxygen goes into that rocket. Alrighty, um, so we are now 10, we are now about 30 minutes away from live launch coverage. Um, let's click on over. Let's see if they have any updates on their site. Not yet. So I am going to put you on hold for a moment and I'm going to go fill my eyeball with moisturizer. Folks, don't ever scratch your eye. Um, <laughs> Paranor was typing it into chat just as I was thinking it. Um, so uh, I am going to put the away, um, away message up for a minute and then I will be right back with a happier eyeball. I will be back. Stay tuned. A rocket launch is coming. Hello everyone, I am back. I do need to add Stella to one of the rockets. It is true. Uh, 
And yes, the rocket would have to be chasing Eddie because that is, that is the reality around here. For those of you who don't know, Stella and Eddie are our mascots here in the Edwardsville location. Um, there is Tink and I can't remember Annie's other dog's name. Um, we have Um, I'm on an open mic. Okay, so there are mistakes with this setup. Puck and Tinkerbell. Um, so yes, uh, I am in a different location than normal today recording, and I still need, I still need to sort out all the technology up here. This is the attic. We have two different streamers on this channel, myself and Binary Blaze, and we each have different doggy mascots. Mine may be heard barking in the background. They are quite fascinated by my neighbor children who are playing games. Um, <laughs> there are no stink bugs up here yet. This is true. This is true. But, uh, yeah, so Stella and Eddie are our mascots. Um, so I think that's London Bee. I think that's when the feed starts, not when launch is. So to return to the rocket launch information, so they're saying 2336 is launch. Um, so they will be starting their feed 15 minutes before that. So about 21 past the next hour. That's uh, when their feed starts, I believe. I could be wrong. I'm just going by their site. Let me restart this. Okay. So I believe that until their live coverage starts at 16 past the hour. Now, other things that we are keeping an eye on right now is uh, I am right here and I'm currently surrounded by storms, some of which are generating tornadoes. And Weather Underground has updated their weather maps in very awkward ways <laughs> that make it really hard to use. Um, so let's see if I can I'm right in here somewhere. So here's Edwardsville. This is headed straight towards me. So we may have some interesting weather occurring. Uh, luckily, the tornado generating nodules are significantly south. Green just means, oh, so this green here, this is the Mississippi River. The solid green blobs are Mississippi River, which is flooding currently. Green on the radar map just means it's going to rain on you. Yellow sometimes gets interesting. Um, and red is, oh dear God, we might die. Um, luckily, most of the red is to either side of us, but things can change radically at any moment. And so we may have some exciting moments as yet to come this evening. I'm going to be keeping an eye on these nodules that are currently to the west of us. Um, yeah, we will see. We will see. The worst presentation I have ever given and the only presentation that I've ever given that I've, I've refused to give them permission to use the audio or the video for was a presentation that I gave um, 
about an hour's drive away from here. And tornado sirens went off twice during the talk. And in between those two moments, there was apple-sized hail hitting the auditorium we were in. And people were instructed to shelter in, in place. And I was told to keep giving my presentation while the tornado sirens went off. And it turns out no one pays attention to astronomy when there's tornado sirens going off and apple-sized hail. Um, so Arnster is writing, I feel like we now need a personal weather scale to go with the usual pain scale found in doctor's offices. Um, yeah, I hope my ISP doesn't either. And I'm not currently on a laptop, so here's to hoping the power is fine. Uh, we will, we should be fine. We should be fine. <laughs> I like the way you're clarifying Annie's war verb. Um, I, I would say like your normal fist sized apple. And I can hear rain starting to hit the skylight. Um, I will, I will send a message out on Twitch chat via my phone. I, if I lose things and stuff, uh, to let you know what's going on. So this, this is reality. Ah, uh, okay. Let's see. How is this storm moving? Let me switch over so you can watch this with me. So here I've, I've turned on the video of the moving storm. You can see things are slowly moving in an upwards direction across the screen. They fall apart as they hit the Mississippi River generally. It's the stuff that survives to cross the Mississippi that is the issue. So I, I don't think it's showing 15 minutes to live stream. I think it's showing 15 minutes. Oh, sorry, 15 minutes to launch. I think it's showing 15 minutes until the live stream kicks in. So, yeah. Um. <laughs> a great screen for a tornado watch. That is true. So there is a window behind me. I have blocked it off so that the light doesn't shine through the green screen. Um, I'm not going to set up tornado cam. I like my equipment. So you're just going to have to deal. I'm not... What, what link are you at, Astro... I'm just showing 13 minutes until like actual coverage starts. Are we the same place, Astra B? Is there another link I should go to? Yeah, Keeper of Maps. I've been hit by a tornado once. I don't intend to be hit by a tornado again. Um, Luckily, I was in my Jeep Wrangler, which is capable of driving over falling trees as they fall down on the road in front of you. Um, but it was still not something I'd like to repeat. Uh, okay, so let's see. That's weird. I wonder why they have two different feeds that looks... This says archive. This is archive footage. All right, let's see. I'm going to keep both of them side by side. They have the exact same countdown. So what, what channel is this? Come on, scroll. I don't want the chat. I want like the actual thingy.
So I suspect that what we're looking at is archive footage and what I don't know is if it's going to switch over to being this is so they're showing archive. I don't know if it's going to switch over to showing live footage. I'm intrigued that it's 40 seconds behind the other live footage. We have them open side by side, so <laughs> they all have different times. Oh man. So Space Flight Now, I think, is looking at the same thing that I'm looking at because that's the feed that's coming from Rocket Lab USA. I'm not sure this one that's watermarked MySpace. Um, I don't know if MySpace is an official feed or not. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Paranoia, that this is just a taking... <gasps> we have a Stella! We have a Stella! Come here! I know, I will pick you up. Come here. I got you, I got you. Why are you wet? It has started raining, people. It has started raining. I have wet, gross dogs. Ooh, you're super wet, Eddie. Why are you super wet? Okay, I have dogs. I have dogs. <laughs> hi, hi, hi. Yeah, so MySpace News is literally just trying to steal coverage from the good folks at Rocket Launch. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Eddie's right here, too. He's just off screen. Um, hi, I don't have a towel. I can't dry you off. Stella is drying herself off on me. Okay, here we go. Eddie is totally water adherent here. He's sticking his head in. Come over here. Can you, can you lean closer? Can you lean closer? No, you can't. Okay. So there are two dogs here. There are two dogs and we are looking at nine minutes in counting until the Rocket Lab feed starts. Come on up, Eddie. Come on up. Okay, so we're losing some green screening in the name of getting the dog. There. Stella is getting big. Her favorite thing, her favorite thing is to shove her head under my chin. Um, yes, she's a blue-eyed dog. Um, I, so <laughs> I love the question, are you at home or at work? That is a very hard thing to answer, Wolf Caller, because they're both the same. Um, I am employed by the Planetary Science Institute, which has offices in Tucson and Boulder, Colorado. But the majority of the PhD scientists that work for the Planetary Science Institute are actually remote employees working from locations all around the world. So I am currently at a desk I only use for work. I am up in my attic in a space that is designated for work when the weather allows. It sometimes gets too cold to be up here. Um, but I'm paying a mortgage on the house. So both, both. I think the answer is both. <laughs> so yes, I, I agree. Annie's dogs will steal your soul. Well, my dogs will simply um, slobber all over you. I believe this is the first sign that the storm is coming. So let's look at the storm. Yes, the storm is coming. Um, I suspect it's going to be north and south of us looking at this. So let's go straight to the end and hit pause. Nope, go straight to the end. So yeah, um, let's see. 
I do indeed believe that it might be straight north of where I am. It's still a few miles away. I don't know how recent this image is. So it's from nine past. So that's brand new image. So it's a few miles out at this point. I live somewhere within the word Edwardsville. <laughs> my, my dogs are very good at things like that, our instro. Very good at things like that. Okay, so here, you hear a storm, don't you? Eddie hears a storm. Hi, hi. You can lay down now. You can lay down. Um, so Hanny's Vorverb asks, if we did a mission to Triton, we could visit an ice giant and a KBO. Maybe we could cheaply send a large cube sat on with Falcon Heavy. So we still don't know how to big, build um, long-term functioning CubeSats. So the issue becomes, what is the cheapest that we could send something all the way out to Neptune and Triton? And the answer is probably about the same as the budget for Europa Clipper. Um, and we wouldn't get as much science as we're going to get for Europa Clipper. The problem that you run into trying to get things out as far as Neptune and Uranus is the large change in velocity needed to go from essentially being on your way out of the solar system to being in orbit around one of those two worlds. You seriously have to drop your velocity and hang a turn to get into orbit around the spacecraft. Not around the spacecraft, around the planet with your spacecraft. And that's just hard. So until we figure out how to build higher impact engines, ion engines just don't do it, that don't weigh a lot, we're not really sure how we're going to pull off that kind of a mission. I can hear the rain coming. I'm going to be quiet for a moment to see if you hear the rain. I am surrounded by anxious dogs. So, so our instro, I, I believe that would have to be a flyby. Um, I just don't see a way that something that only weighs 3,500 pounds would, or kilograms even, would have the fuel on board necessary to maneuver to get into orbit around Pluto. One of the issues you run into with Pluto in particular is it doesn't have a lot of mass, so you can't use its gravity to slow you down. At least with Uranus and Neptune, you have the gravity of these ice giants to slow your spacecraft, and that helps. Uh, ultimately, the only really effective way to get to those worlds is on an extremely long time um, gravity assist upon gravity assist kind of orbital dance. The kind of maneuvers that the Solar Parker probe is doing, the kind of maneuvers that Beposax is doing to get to Mercury, uh, those are, not Beposax, Bepo Colombo, the kinds of maneuvers that those two spacecraft are doing with gravity assist upon gravity assist, that's what we need in order to be able to make it. Um, so I'm going to make sure I have the correct audio set up. Hold on just a moment. So 
So I'm currently setting up so that you will get higher quality audio. And this just requires me to um, set things up a bit nicer. Okay, I'm not sure why this is being an angry device. Sorry, you are now seeing more screens than you need to see. figuring this out. Okay, so you should now have audio when the audio starts. The Grand Tour alignment, Larry, was a rare and beautiful thing. This is the particular lineup of the planets that occurred during the 70s and 80s that allowed the Voyager missions to, um, in one beautiful sweeping motion, see so many different worlds. Uh, that kind of alignment isn't going to happen again in our lifetimes. So we were lucky that the needed technology was created just in time to take advantage of that. It was a perfect motivation. So here's to hoping that we get more like that. Um, looking to see... I'm very calmly worrying about whether or not I'm going to be able to hear anything. Let's turn that off. Airport on. Okay, so now I no longer have any error messages. We should be completely good to go. Uh, delayed 10 minutes. No, no. Okay, so let's take a look and see what they're saying on Twitter, because this is where the newest information is usually located, and not right now. So let's see if we have anything on a hashtag electron launch. Five thirty six Mountain. Okay, so that's consistent with what I thought. Let's do latest instead of top. Thank you guys for the retweets. Um, so I'm not seeing anything on the delay scrub for the day no no the live webcast and launch will be available 15 minutes before starting in six minutes kerbal do you have a link if you look up rocket lab this video well that's a good sign um okay Okay, let's try Rocket Lab. Uh, I'm seeing sadness. The team has identified a video transmitter 13 de decibels down with low performance. It 
it's not an issue for flight, but we under, want to understand why, so we're waving off for the day. We'll assess and advise a new liftoff time soon. This isn't a happy face. Um, I have, I usually don't use the web browser for looking at Twitter, Larry. I usually use TweetDeck on, um, a mobile device, uh, or TweetDeck on the device. Right now, uh, if you look, I'm not logged into Twitter, so it's just default. So for this particular moment, you're stuck with default. Um, at least it didn't go boom. That is entirely correct, Paranor. Uh, there, there was one time I, I had an appointment to get a massage because you should do that now and then, be good to yourself. And the nice woman asked, so how was your day? And the best I could say was, well, nothing exploded. And she looked at me and she's like, is that a normal problem in your job? And I said, well, I work in aerospace sometimes, and a few weeks ago, one of our rockets exploded. And it happened while I was covering it live for students, and it was bad. And she was very confused, and I said, no one died, nothing exploded. We call that a good day, I think. And then I never went back for another appointment because we had a very awkward conversation for the rest of the massage. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a nerd. I don't always interact very well. Um, five minutes to launch if they don't back off again. Wait, what, Astro B? What? I'm so confused, Astro B. What are you looking at? I see nothing. Astro B, we need a link. I thought they scrubbed. Why are you saying five minutes to launch if they don't back off? <laughs> Mr. Bill Ackman is putting it very, <laughs> yes. Astro B, please explain. Um. <laughs> Never kick carbon fiber. Don't kick rockets in general. This is how you make things explode. Um, yeah, I still see scrubbed too. Astro B, explain. I No, don't kick humans either. You can kick cans. Cans were the only thing meant to be kicked other than like sport balls. Um, no kicking humans, no kicking rockets. Kick soccer balls, footballs, kick balls. There's lots of sport balls that like to be kicked. This is what I've determined. Okay, so I don't know what to say here other than it doesn't look like we're going to have a rocket launch. So, I, I, <laughs> thank you, Astro B. <laughs> no go Zoom. Um, that is fair. So when this actually occurs, we will bring it to you live. It is likely going to be Annie Wilson by Naria Blaze. She knows so much more about rocket lunches than I do. Um, and thank you, Rocket Sage. Um, and it was so great to have all of you join us for the day. Uh, once again, my name is Dr. Pamela Gay. I am one of your hosts right here on Cosmic Quest X, where we bring you not just live events like this, but we also bring you the Sunday Science Hour, the Daily Space, all at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. That is 
currently 5 p.m. London time until the rest of the world switches to daylight savings time. We are, well, your place to learn and do science. So give us a follow. Follows are free. And um, sorry, I'm distracted by the fact that there is a stink bug slowly climbing my tripod towards the camera. Uh, give us a follow. They're free. Find out whenever we go live with science as it happens. Um, we are here. Thanks to you. We are sustained through the generous contributions, through donations, bits, and Patreon of people like you. Thank you, Fenmil. Thank you so much. Uh, I feel the need to show you the bug, but I would never be able to get my system back together, although it is climbing. It is now like an inch away from the camera. Uh, <laughs> we can blame everything on the stink bug. Uh, so, um, we are here thanks to the generous contributions of people like you. Thank you so much for allowing us to keep going. Um, the stink bug is now crawling around behind. I'm going to see if I can get this because really this is so disturbing to watch. Come on, come on. So the trick with stink bugs is to get them without pissing them off. I'm going to screw up my camera doing this. There we go. So this, let me see if I can get the camera to focus. This is what I deal with on a regular basis. And this one is missing a leg. I now feel slightly sorry for it. So you can't just kill a stink bug the way you can kill other bugs because they release this terrible, terrible odor and will make you regret all of your life choices. And that did not go as planned. There we go. So once again, here is the five-legged, wow, I don't have coordination, five-legged stink bug. Okay. Yeah, so I shall dispose of him after the stream is over somewhere else because I do not wish to leave the stink in here. Um, skunks are cuter, but more dangerous. That, that is true. So, um, I am going to take the five legged stink bug somewhere else. Um, now that it is no longer distracting me, I'm going to finish doing the credits. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here. CosmoQuest X is a production of the Planetary Science Institute working in collaboration with Youngstown State University. We are supported by you, and we are so grateful for all that you have done to keep the science flowing. We never know when we're going to go live. And if you do miss any of those random moments, check us out over on YouTube where we archive everything we can. And um, probably not this stream, but uh, check us out over on YouTube. And if you can please also subscribe on YouTube, subscriptions on YouTube are free. It will really help our channel grow. Thank you for being here. I do not have credits set up and working on this particular screen. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and pull up the recent events and say thank you to everyone who did awesome things. Thank you, Fenmil. Thank for the bits. Thank you, Crispy Fried Man, for subscribing for four months. Thank you, Rocket Sage, for gifting a sub to Kerbal. Um, thank you, Astro YYZ, for the resub for six months. Thank you all for being here. This has been our failure to launch coverage of DARPA's uh, new little satellite on an electron rocket from New Zealand. When this rock ac rocket actually launches, we will bring it to you here live 
right on CosmoQuest. And thank you, Keeper of Maps, for the bits. I am now going to say um, goodbye, farewell, and have a fabulous morning, evening, or afternoon wherever in the world you may be. And remember, if the weather allows, go outside and look up. There may be a fabulous solar storm if you're far enough north or south. Um, if like me, you're looking at tornadoes, stay inside. <laughs> Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>